What the fuck is good? Ah, today's Saturday, January 30th, 2021. And you're in for another episode of the Corporate Cowboys podcast. I am your host, Alex. Yours truly, the intern. Powered by Incorporating Associates. You know how that goes. Associates, Incorporating Associates. Literally, figuratively, our namesake. Well, it's lunchtime. You know what that means. Come on in, step into my office. Let's have a little brown bag lunch. You don't even have to talk. Let me do all the talking. You can munch and listen. You've got a mouth and ears. And if you're using one, you can use both because they're separate operations. They're separate physiological operations. Or or you can separate the physiological operations to the extent that as you chew and savor your food, you are able to listen. You ever wonder how multitasking actually works? Well, I've done a little research. But that's not what this episode is on. Mentally, you're here. Mentally, I'm here. Ideally, where I would like to be is someplace better. Always. Always. So physically, what do I need to do? I need to move better. I need to head into a better direction. I must orient myself to be better so that I might appreciate the situation, so that I might appreciate my situation and make it better. And yes, appreciate does mean to assess, to evaluate, to be aware to gain that situational awareness and translate it into something tactical, something operational. If you're joining me for the first time, you'll notice that this podcast is, um, well, yeah, it's different from any other. Obviously, it's unique. You got your boy, Alex, on the motherfucking ones and twos. And... How does it relate to corporate, you might ask? It doesn't relate directly to corporate. It should relate to the corporate cowboy and who they are, who we are. The corporate cowboy is the individual, is the individual with a corporate mindset. The stand-up guy with the criminal mind. I mean, because let's face it, crimes get committed every day inside of corporate (laughs) so it's not that hard to think criminally but do right i mean for some i don't fucking get it they gotta bend over backwards to do right and it's so hard it's so difficult you know they blame it on their environment how they grew up but they didn't come up disadvantaged they just chose to take advantage They chose to take over advantage, to exploit. Rarely, rarely is there a justification for such conduct. But again, that's not what this episode is about. This episode is going to be about, this episode will be about niche studying. What the fuck is niche studying, Alex? You're going to have to explain that a little bit. Okay, well, allow me to first explain a little bit of my background, a little bit of my historical background. When I was younger, when I was younger, I had a lot of great ideas, good ideas. I'm not going to say great, I'll say good, because good, it's, it's an absolute. I had many good ideas. Ideas that I believe could be capitalized on are capitalizable, profitable even, 
though, even when I was young, I was idealistic. I was altruistic. I genuinely believed in spreading these ideas, sharing them. And I was naive and innocent, in a sense, to believe that if I shared my good ideas, my good ideas would take me places. Of course, like any good idea, if you want it done right, <laughs> you have to do it yourself. And I did a lot of the legwork. I did a lot of the legwork for my good ideas. And while they involved creating work, the result of said work would be better. That's it, just, just better. It would, it would result in something better in any position. I'm not going to say any and every position I held. There were some there were some positions where I had bad ideas, um, ideas on how to ideas on how to exploit bad in the absolute sense. So while they were they were novel ideas, they were ideas that could be used to exploit. Yeah, I've played both sides of the fence. Okay, so I'm not a fucking saint. I don't. I don't, uh, what is it? I don't allege, I don't claim to be. I don't allege to be, I don't claim to be. So I may not be a role model, but for some, the idea of living through corporate might be cool. So I'd much rather have a cool factor than be a role model, if that makes any sense. You wanna be cool? Shit, I'll show you how to remain cool how to remain calm, how to remain collected as the shit just burns down around you. And it's not that hard. But a role model? <laughs> what kind of role model walks into a place that's burning down? What kind of a role model does bad, right? So, no role models. Um... While I was in school, when I returned to school, I definitely, um, it was uh, a period of adjustment, at least a year, I think. The first semester, I was still kind of like, I, I was still really, um, uh, what is it called? What is it called when, um, when you're new? <laughs> Something I'd, I was still really, uh, What is it called? Springy eyed? That was just really springy, I guess. Like like a sense of cheer, like a sense of positivity, of of like a sense of um of innocence. Like I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Like uh, doughy eyed. There you go, motherfucker. Returning to school. Yeah, I was still pretty I was still kinda doughy eyed because I had left school, did some work. Came back, back into school. I was a little older, maybe, you know, on the older side of my cohort returning to school. And uh, now that I was back in, I mean, I, I, I was able to associate with the younger crowd, you know, get into their happenings, what's going on, staying current on, on, uh, on, on, on events happening to a slightly younger cohort. And I was all about it. I was all about it. But at the same time that I returned to school, I, I recognized that I'm a student just like they are. And I've got my own goals. I've got my own objectives. And I want to learn what I want to learn. Because that's the whole reason I returned to school. Because I found my calling, for lack of a better concept, for lack of a better phrase. I've, I found my calling outside of school. And upon my return... I wanted to learn as much as I could in order to aid me on my path. And thus was born niche studying. I wanted to study only what I wanted to study. 
I wanted to dive head first into curing cancer, nuclear fusion, cold fusion, fission, all that good shit. I wanted to. I wanted to. But I couldn't. And that shit is uh, frustrating. It's fucking frustrating. While I was in school, I'd, I realized quick that I could have done all that outside. But I'm in school now to change the system of academia because it nets in, it wrangles in so many young souls into doing exactly what the school wants that the students forget what they want to do. They have the creativity and the inspiration beaten out of them with general education. Like you just want general average people. (laughs) Who the fuck wants that? Niche studying essentially would replace general education. I'm not saying to do away completely with general education. You could. I mean, it would be a greater shock to the system, similar to how I'm not saying you should replace, um, completely abolish minimum wage. You could, but that would completely shock the system. But there should be uh, different avenues, as there are in the labor marketplace, in the workforce. There's independent contractors, 1099s. Avenues that not many are privy to. Folks don't really learn about them. Even in high school, you're told to get a job. What is a job? It's an hourly job. Get an hourly job. They aren't taught how to negotiate. They aren't taught how to evaluate. They aren't, they aren't taught how to learn. <laughs> They're not. They're just told what to know. They're just told what to regurgitate on the test, on the exam, and all of that shit is standardized to make them general, to make them general students, not generals. Shit, if they were generals, they were captains, I'd, I'd fucking bring them on board. But no, just general, just average students. <laughs> And so through niche studying, if it were implemented as early as middle school, fucking middle school students are some of the most creative, some of the most creative. But again, I don't want to get involved with, um, with underage kids, underage brats more than I do uh, majority Brats, fucking overage adults who don't have fucking shit going for them, who are, who've stayed average their whole fucking life, who've stayed general their whole fucking life. I have nothing against sheep. I have nothing against sheep. We need the reproduction. Why? Because, I mean, if I'm not doing it, somebody else has to do it. And they'll be creating the future markets. So, yeah, I need. I need future markets. So by all means, have as many kids as you possibly like. Have as many kids as you can afford. But niche studying, you could even start that in the home by encouraging, empowering your children to learn what they want to learn. Yeah, it, it's a it's a struggle to get them to get them. Um, what is it to get them started to attract them to a certain subject? It takes a minute to actually get them, get them attached to create that attachment. And there are tools and mechanisms for that, of which I'm not here to show you because again, I'm not into child development. Though, I mean, let's be real. We're all children grown or otherwise children of God, all that good jazz. And there are still ways of creating attachment, even in adults. It's 
a different playing field from the from little league to the majors. I get it. From the minors to the majors. But niche studying, niche studying should be there. It should be there. Very few people, very few people, um, how, how, how do I say, land, land on it? Very few people land on it in their lifetime. Yeah, it's like throwing darts, land. Very few people land on it in their lifetime. I was, I was blessed to hit it early. <laughs> I was blessed to hit it early and want to learn what I wanted to learn. It hasn't made it hasn't made me rich. It hasn't made me a rich man. If anything, it's made me um, a lot more bellicose. Because good ideas are they're not hard to come by, but good ideas are hard to promote. They are their own little hills to die on. Especially when someone has a, a bad idea that's already in force. <laughs> but before, uh, before this episode takes a turn for the worst, niche studying, essentially, if you were to start it in high school. Because, I mean, uh, when you're, when you're in, uh, in the lower grades, say from like K through six... K through six is like just before middle school starts. You're learning just the basics, reading, writing, arithmetic. Nice. Okay. And maybe some, uh, some history, some social studies, but let's be honest, history and social studies aren't worth shit right now. When victors can rewrite it the way they like, it doesn't fucking matter. All you need to know is how to read them, not what they say. Fuck all that. So as long as you learn how to read, how to write, how to count, that's all you really need to know. And then the world is literally your oyster. Literally, your oyster. Through niche studying. What is your niche? And everybody has a niche. Everyone is a niche when you really think of it on a metaphysical level. Everyone is their own little corner of the universe. Everyone is their own little corner of reality. Your your field of vision is what? 190, 220, 220 areas, 220 areas, 220 degrees of, um, of view, right? There is still a corner and that corner is right behind the center of your forehead. <laughs> That's the corner. And everybody's fucking got one. Everybody is one. Yeah, even if it is an obtuse angle. Imagine that. It's a corner. 220 degrees. You're probably wondering what is an obtuse and fucking what is an acute, acute obtuse angle? <laughs> oh man and in this studying if implemented correctly you could counsel young students because I mean there's plenty of social workers there's plenty of social workers and just they don't know how to fucking sell themselves I was talking uh, to an associate the other day on what soft science really means Soft science degrees mean shit. Mean shit. You still have to hustle. You still have to sell yourself. You have to market yourself. It has to be marketable. Nobody's going to want to pull you onto their team for 80, 120 Gs a year. And you're just theorizing on gender and women's studies. No, they don't need theories. They don't need theories, baby. They need practice. They need practical use. Practical utility, something that works, not theory, something that works. And um, sadly, a lot of folks have gone to school with the belief that, that they're learning and that when they get out, they won't have to work. Like, how the fuck does that make sense? <clears throat> Sorry, accent. How the fuck does that make sense? 
what, just because you think you learned something, you don't have to work to make your money? Nah. That's like putting yourself on a pedestal. And there are there are plenty of students, unfortunately. Plenty of adults, not even people in school. Plenty of adults who, who because they've grown older, who think they have the seniority, who think they've learned something in their in their older age that they no longer have to work they still have to work but they might know more and so that means they must work smarter if they truly believe they are more smart <laughs> and niche studying would encourage that in young students for young students expresses interest in a subject matter in a, in, a, in, a, in a field of study that student should be fucking kicked into that field of study booted pretty much see i was gonna say kick started but no just kicked just kicked because if it's something that they're attracted to if it's something that they're interested they won't drown they'll breathe <laughs> it's like breathing water they'll swim like fishes and um we will definitely prove that fish aren't dumb because we aren't testing them on how to climb trees kind of situation, that kind of thing. If everyone is tested, and that's how they are, and these standardized tests on how to climb trees, then the fish is dumber than the monkey, right? Right? But what if all the fish knows is water? What if all the fish is attracted to, is interested in, it can only live in water? And the monkey, well, trees and vines. So if a student early on expresses some interest in, it could be anything, art, music, science, rhetoric, arithmetic, chemistry they express it early on putting them back in general education and having them suffer through a class they are not interested in and it's literally suffering i mean i'm not going to say it's violence because that's that new age speak violence get the fuck out of here but it is suffering it is suffering because it adds to to their human condition it adds to the human condition. It adds to the overall suffering of the humor of a human condition having to put them through courses of general education that they don't give a fuck about. So, I mean, I, let me break it down. Let me break it down even simpler, even more simple, even simpler. If someone, let's say Alex, if young Alex had a great interest in science and mathematics, could give a fuck about English, uh, just learn the really the, the 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 basics of reading. Because let's be honest, if you're gonna be studying science and mathematics, you still have to read, and it's pretty dense. It's pretty dense. It's pretty concise. You gotta know what you're fuck. You have to know what you're reading so you don't burn yourself. You don't you don't kill yourself. You don't poison yourself. Okay. Um. But say I gave a shit about like creative writing about about uh the english literature about um critical reading or, or whatever just like the theory of, of of writing just a theory of literature and i wanted to know numbers and symbols that's all i that's all i know that's that's how i came up right like since i was young maybe i came up in a household of of uh, pretty savvy chemists, like uh, novice chemists, amateur chemists. And they were pretty cool in the kitchen or whatever. I don't know, gastronomy is, is one of those as well, you could say. Uh, the, the art of cooking, the science of cooking. But I wanted to know more. And so I took it upon myself to, to either visit the library uh, at school or visit the library in the city and just check out chemistry books and science books and and just dove right into them and uh and so and so my history grades are lacking oh shit and so my social studies grades are lacking oh no 
So are my English grades. I'm not paying as much attention to those classes because fuck those classes. I'm trying to build... I'm trying to build fucking nukes out here. Or whatever. I'm trying to not build nukes. I'm sorry. Why do I... I'm trying to I'm trying to fuse nuclear material out here. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to fucking create nuclear energy. So that's what I'm worried about. That's all I care. I'm going to reach a certain point of diminishing returns without English. I may never need history or, I don't know, art history. But they could be used to enhance the way I present, the way I move, the way I so associate, the way I incorporate, interact with other associates. And so while I might exhaust the field of chemistry, physics, science, and math, in middle school, just like the to the level that I'm able to, in middle school, and then in high school, hopefully with the aid of a counselor, a counselor who's not a fucking afraid of the administration. Well, have you considered taking an English class? Maybe you should add another uh, fucking sociology class. You know, and I majored in sociology. I have nothing against it, but now looking back, um, and using putting my sociology degree to work, looking back, uh, this could all be improved. This the the system, the system of academia, the institution of education, can be improved. It could be made better. But let me continue. In niche studying, it necessarily requires more work. Everyone must work, more work. And it's not even intensive, it's just better work. It's just working smarter. There's, there's still teachers who say, I can't, I can't believe I gotta, I gotta take money out of my own pocket to buy school supplies or whatever the fuck. You, you won't need to buy everybody's school supplies if, if some kids are, don't give a fuck about what's going on in class. But you need more teacher's assistance, and those exist. You need uh, you need better teachers' assistance. I mean, you could be you could arguably be paid a little less, and focus your attention on maybe five five students that you could really devote time to, and help orient them into their likes, into what they are interested in, into their prospective fields of study, and that's why I don't want to go too young because then that gets messy. <clears throat> you can't ever be friends with with an older generation you can be associates but you can't be friends but that's personal experience <clears throat> so that's why I mean I'm 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 suggesting high school. I'm petitioning for high school because in high school, students are becoming aware of themselves, are waking up to the world, are waking up to how it operates, how it functions, and are becoming less interested in some areas and increasingly more interested in others. They're developing their niche. If you don't know where your niche is, it's because you've probably either been doing it and it's become normal for you some folks call it being on the spectrum being autistic but the spectrum is a spectrum for a reason we're all on it functionally or not functional or not we have our interests we have what we care about we have what's important to us we have what's our priority we have what we deem to be priorities we have our quirks we have our flaws our faults we have our defects we have our imperfections we have what we're good at we have what we're the best at we have what we're savants at some of us connoisseurs of items that we just have intricate, intimate knowledge of that others would say, that's fucking weird. 
This guy's fucking... This, this person is fucking weird. You're on the spectrum. It's a spectrum for a reason. Though, if you're familiar with the gray area, if you're familiar with operating in the gray area, if you regularly take the gray pill, it's all the same. Nothing is different. You approach every interaction as if it were a new one with the opportunity to make a new associate and you let life run its course and you're running with it. You're running your show in the corner, in your corner. You're running your own show. You're in control of your own movie. You're the director, you produce it in your own little corner of reality. We're about halfway through, and obviously, well not obviously, but it's apparent, I don't have any uh, corporate sponsorships. So this, uh, this show is recorded, produced by yours truly. And to do so, I mean, I take a little bit of time out of my day in order to do these, and I don't mind it at all because they serve for me, they serve as a function for me to be able to vent, for me to be able to uh, to approach matters in, uh, in, in spoken word, uh, to put ideas out there um, overtly, um, to inject the universe with ideas. I mean, if I can think it, somebody else has thought it. If I can say it, it's probably been said. If there's nothing new under the sun kind of thing. And so I would like to think that the change is happening. The change is happening. And I have, I have not I have not even got to the best parts of this episode. I was going to read an excerpt from a book that I had just read. And um, and the book, I think, is a little it's a little dated. But I think if I'm not mistaken. Oh, it's 2008. It's a 2008 book. So that's good. I mean, the idea was out there, but I came, I came into the idea of niche studying a little later on my own, mind you. So when I read this book, I was like, yeah, I like, when I read the book, I was thinking, yeah, like there's nothing new under the sun. Like this, this idea appeared in my mind, this idea, this process for niche studying appeared in my mind, but in no way is it new. Niche, 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 niche. So this podcast, <laughs> he's probably, probably wondering like, what the fuck? This podcast serves as a um, medium for me to practice how, what, how I preach, to practice how I preach. Fuck yeah. To practice how I preach and to practice what I preach. Obviously, I hate repeating myself and because I'm always, I'm, I'm touting the new, I'm touting not the new, the better. I'm touting the better, the innovation. I, I, I want innovative processes to come out on top overall. Uh, that's why I, I don't like repeating um, certain ideas, certain ideas that can become repetitive. But if I can, um, I'll reiterate them. And so in that way, there will be recurring themes on the podcast, but not every episode is going to be about the same shit kind of thing. Like there is a recurring theme to the corporate cowboys, and that is motherfuckers who were born into corporate. The United States of America is a corporate entity, or you must at least approach it as if it is a corporate entity. And then uh, your mindset changes changes just like that where it, it's different it's different th than applying to work for a corporation and you know you're being onboarded and you're handed your w-2 and you become an employee it's different being born into one and when you think that way your mind i mean it's your mind fucked first the first couple of uh the first couple of instances the first couple of iterations but it's when when it's reiterated, when it's reapproached and reintroduced, just like this podcast is with every couple of episodes that you consume. <laughs> it's getting you into that mind state. I'm 
I've mentioned before on this podcast, everything that comes out of one's mouth is a key. And a person's ear into their brain is a lock. And you got to learn how to fucking pick locks. <laughs> what do you think? You thought I was going to see you have to how to forge keys? Nah, it's going to take fucking forever. You have to get married to each and every one of them. Fuck that. No lifelong commitments here because life is short. We're cowboys, remember? Criminal minds. But but stand up guys. So you gotta lo- you gotta know how to pick locks and do so in an ethical way. Yeah, and do so ethically in an ethical manner. And this podcast serves as an outlet for that. To vent, for me to be able to vent, for me to be able to practice how I think, practice how I speak, practice how I vocalize, pronounce, enunciate, intonate, intone, intone, intonate, intonate, practice my intonation. So you'll hear, you'll, you may hear me go, you may hear because this is a stream of consciousness, all of it, none of this shit is scripted. I mean, besides what I read, none of this shit is scripted, uh, not even the advertisement, which we were just getting started into, and I deviated from it onto this tangent of what the podcast is even about. So today's sponsor is um, is a stress ball. Yeah, might as well, a stress ball. Even now, while I'm recording, I'm using a stress ball. And it's not keeping my mind occupied, but it's keeping my hand occupied. And I noticed that I could perform um, little tricks with it. Every now and then I do drop it, but luckily it's not an egg that'll break and shatter on the ground. It's just a stress ball. And if I do drop it, I can just pick it up. But it allows me to think. That's where I got the idea that um, you can go ahead and eat. This is a lunch hour. You can go ahead and eat and listen if you can. And if you've ever been listening to music or watching television and you've been eating, I don't know, a sandwich, chips, using a fork, knife, spoon. If you've ever been eating and you found yourself chewing slower to hear to hear clearly, to listen clearly, or you've been, or, or you paused a little bit in between uh, notes, in between lines on the screen, so, or, or in between songs on the radio to catch what's going on, or you find you're chewing to match the rhythm of what's being said, of what's, of what you're hearing, of what you're listening to, yeah, there's a little bit more to that multitasking, like I said. You're training yourself. You don't know, but you're training yourself. Or or you're being trained. And your lock is getting picked. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> I do know. And I am just saying. So back to niche... Niche, back to niche studying. Niche studying, what is it all about? What is it all about? Well, um, I was reading a book called Tribal Leadership. Tribal Leadership, Leveraging Natural Groups to Build a Thriving Organization. Leveraging natural groups to build a thriving organization. Essentially, it's the book is about how to become a uh, the leader of a tribe, how to form a tribe within an organization, and then have the tribe take over the organization. Essentially, it's how to start culture, how to influence culture, how to impact culture inside of an organization. I I studied a lot about this um, in my undergrad. I was, a, again, I mentioned a sociology major at a uh, pretty prestigious research university on the West Coast. And um, my, my learning sent me down uh, those paths for, for investigating uh, leadership. And 
and uh, exploring how to develop it, how to cultivate it within a group of individuals, within a group of individuals, because I mean, who, who, I mean, some people do want to be led. Let's be real. Some people do enjoy taking orders, not having to think critically, not having to, to expend mental energy and would just much rather squeeze the trigger. Would much rather be pointed to would, would no would much rather have someone do the pointing and then they just squeeze the trigger they would much rather expend the physical energy and save themselves the mental exhaustion the mental exertion the mental the mental work and this book tribal leadership leveraging natural groups to build a thriving organization goes into a bit of that. The authors are David Logan, John King, and Haley Fisher Wright. That's David Logan, David. Dave Logan, John King, and Haley Fisher Wright. Tribal leadership, leveraging natural groups to build a thriving organization. And there is a chapter in here that I found increasingly, that I found really interesting. I found it really interesting. It uh, begins, hold on. I would say the page number, but um, if there's different editions out there, they may all be, um, they may be different. But the chapter is chapter 10. So the pagination, the pagination is like the page numbers, how the page numbers are set up might be different from edition to edition. If they're edited down or like different chapters are added and there's another version on the market. Um, this one was published in 2008. And so chapter 10 begins on page 183. The excerpt that I was on is uh, starts on page 199. And the and, uh, section is called Upgrading. Is it Upgrading? Upgrading a Tribe one triad at a time. And I'll try to give you a little bit of context, but I'm not going to explain a whole lot because this this um this section in itself is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, this excerpt is pretty self-explanatory and uh, I'll I'll give a little con- I'll give a little opinion on it afterward because uh, this isn't the only thing I'll be reading. So the chapter is called um triads and stage four networking right chapter 10 the section inside of the chapter is called upgrading a tribe one triad at a time and it's about david kelly david kelly has two professional passions ideo ideo that's a company name and stanford tending ideo's culture is like falling off a log compared to what's going on at the university The traditional role of professor has been described as sage on a stage. It's like a group dental practice with experts living in separate offices. So um, dental professionals will rent office space from one another. And that's where you get uh, the traditional dental group. It's different dentists who come together, throw down on a on a professional workspace and work out of it together. Damn, that gives me another topic for for an episode, a podcast episode. But I said this one was going to be on niche studying, so let's get to it. Getting people of all kinds to change their lifelong habits of operating independently and start to operate as a team is a big challenge. Big challenge. And then they have these little coaching tips thrown in. Um, let me, I wonder, should I read this? Nah, fuck it. I'm not going to read that. Uh, onto the uh, main topic, onto the main, main course. Yeah. Kelly says at Stanford design school, we're looking at the entire academic model. Stanford is winning the hell out of Nobel prizes. And that's a great thing that comes from deep expertise. What we're trying to do is give students another tool, a tool we call design thinking. If you're using design thinking, you're inviting students to collaborate in the learning process by having multiple professors in the classroom with different points of view. The students will need to make up their own minds about what matters to them, not what matters to the professors. 
if you uh, recall, literally less than 20 minutes ago, how I was going into niche studying and saying that it would require additional teaching aids, teachers aids in the classroom with students pursuing what matters to them, helping and assisting students pursue what matters to them. So, I mean, ideally, you could call them professors if you want, but they're teaching assistants. And they're not teaching assistants to the professors. They're teaching assistants to the students. For the students to be able to tailor their own education. Not done. I'm not done. Sorry, sorry. I'm not finished. See, I have to... Uh, I have to also just a little off just a little offshoot. I have to also be mindful of words that sound like other words like done and dumb, d o n e and d u m b because um now that we're moving into like the not now that we're moving it towards incorporating digital technologies in our in our day-to-day -day interaction um using words like that without context without enough contextual support enough contextual backing can actually cause a person's mind the one who is listening can cause their mind to deviate where it caused me to deviate now and i'm just talking to myself for when i said i'm done or i'm not done i'm not um it it, it caused me to think like ah, what if what if he said dumb what if he said he was dumb <laughs> But I wasn't finished with the excerpt. So <clears throat> by having multiple professors in the classroom with different points of view, the students will need to make up their own minds about what matters to them, not what matters to the professors. Man, I can't get I can't get away from how dope that sentence sounds. And this sentence spans two pages. Like it, it it's on the it's on the it's on like the flip of two pages. So I, and I don't know. I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of books, and and I have to make I have to take note of them so I could bring them onto the podcast and uh, and really explore them because I don't know how such fucking enlightening words, enlightening, illuminating. I don't know how such illuminating words can be straddling two pages and not get enough attention. Like maybe it's maybe it's maybe the page break is supposed to break up the sentence. Like it just gets me into a whole theory of, of um, ethereal conspiracy, but let's not do that. Esoteric conspiracy. <laughs> let's not do that. I'm not finished. By having multiple, yes, I'm repeating it. By having multiple professors in the classroom with different points of view, the students will need to make up their own minds about what matters to them, not what matters to the professors. Mm. I think this is ultimately going to change the fundamental way we approach learning in order to equip people with a broader set of tools for solving the big problems in the world. So they're essentially equipping them with tools. And they, like, this is Kelly's word. These, these are Kelly's words. Kelly genuinely believes that they are doing the students a favor. <laughs> they are doing the students a favor by having more than one professor in the classroom. Oh, fucking... Goodness gracious. They think they're doing them a favor and not what education is supposed to be. In the past, in the past, that's how it used to be, I think. A student would bring ideas to school and then would test their soundness in, in, in the context. They would test the soundness, I guess, in the field, in the field of education. They would test an idea's validity amongst their peers, amongst their seniors, if you want, amongst the, the professors of the time. And the professors would either say, yes, you're on the right track, or would add maybe a certain nuance for the student to continue thinking about their idea and how an additional... And how, and how an additional nuance, an additional adjustment or change would affect the idea in its absolute. How it, how it would affect the idea in a student's mind. Because, yeah, I mean, professors are also equipped with lockpicks. Let's not, let's not 
what is it? Kid ourselves. Let's not fucking joke. Let's not kid ourselves in believing that professors don't have, aren't equipped with lockpicks. I've seen them in action many, many times. And that's why I, I might have, uh, I might have a bone to pick with academia and education in general because I've taken new ideas to the university. And when I present them to these professors, I mean, I, I can only describe them as being soft as fuck, bitch made. Because my introduction of idea, they treat like, I mean, they, they don't they don't say like, oh, wow, that is a that is a weird what is it that, that that's a that's a new that, that that's a new how do I say it in a way that doesn't completely shit on education because I mean education is valuable don't get me wrong but just the institution right now how it exists currently is it's fucking flawed it's it's horribly flawed but these professors instead of taking my idea and then adding adding their own experience to it and in order to help me on my understanding for sociology. If I came in with a different idea or, or an idea that wasn't learned in class, they treated it. I mean, and, and keep in mind, these motherfuckers are, are PhDs, have, have masters and PhDs, um, which again, just, just lends to the fucking, to the fuckery just lends to the fuckery that is soft science. That's why folks don't take doctorates in soft science seriously because they're bitch made. They're fucking bitch made. And that's probably why, that might be why I didn't chose to pursue uh, soft science much longer. But I got what I needed from it. I got how to got, I got the tools that I needed to get started. And now I'm just, I'm a social researcher on my own. I, I know what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And that's all that matters. I'm not going to be told what to say. I'll decide what to say. I'll decide what to think. I'll decide how to go about investigating it. It's up to me to forge my own lockpicks. It's up to me. It's up to me to forge my own lockpicks. If I'm handed secondhand lockpicks and they're all bent to shit because they've been used on the same lock and, and or they've been used, they've been used and abused, they've been neglected, Fuck all that mess. I'm forging my own. Why am I getting mad? What the fuck? Oh, niche studying. That's right. These PhDs. These PhDs and masters. They'd act like I was contradicting their entire understanding of sociology. So it, it just... It, it, it made me think. Like, how confident are they in their understanding of sociology of what I... If what I bring to them causes them to question their entire fucking existence, like causes them not that deep, right? I'm not that deep, but if it causes them to question what they've learned, they go through a bout of cognitive dissonance where they, ha they have to protect their PhD. So, and I've seen it between myself, between other colleagues who have uh, different ideas and they bring up, they bring them up to the professor in class and the professor will take your, your question because they are professional to an extent. They'll take your question in class and then if you assert an idea that that might be contrary to what they're preaching or that might, that, that might deliver some nuance on what they're preaching, they, they can't have it. They literally doctor and PhD their way out of it. They can't fucking have it. So they'll, they'll talk circles around you, similar to how a doctor writes, like that joke that says like, I can't read shit this doctor wrote because you know they have messy handwriting or whatever the fuck. Maybe they have bigger fish to fry in their mind because they're learned doctors. But similar to how a doctor writes, PhDs and masters and those motherfuckers in soft science, professors who, who feel the need to protect their, their, their sense of existence as a professor in sociology, who feel the need to protect their own thesis or their own dissertation that they're teaching on in the class, in the particular class, they, they will literally shoot themselves in the foot and look like fucking jackasses and then explain it in a way where you're wrong. You're wrong because they shot themselves in the foot. How the fuck does that work? It doesn't help the students at all. If anything, I mean, but there are, there are some students who, who, who gobble it up, who eat it up, who are lost in the sea that is 
higher education, just lost. So everything that comes out of the professor's mouth goes right into their fucking lock and they get mind fucked with it. So, so they have to believe everything that comes out of the professor's mind because this professor has a PhD, has a master's degree. Why would I question anything that, that comes out of my professor's mouth? I have to, but, but keep in mind, I came into education a little bit later in life. So I've seen the way the world works. I've seen the way the world functions and I've seen the way organizations, corporations move and operate. So... I know what the professor is doing, and I know why the professor is doing it. I was already a sociologist before I studied sociology. The professor might have been one of those who went from K through 12 immediately into a four-year university, immediately into a master's program, immediately into a PhD, and not have a lick of fucking life experience has never been questioned, has never been challenged, has been book smart their entire life, knows nothing about the street life, knows nothing about prison rules, knows nothing about, about bloodshed, knows nothing about fucking violence, though they preach it. So when they get challenged, when their ideal gets challenged, that's violence to them. And so they lash out, so they cry, so, so they whine and they complain. They say, oh no, we're not teaching that this quarter, we're not teaching that in this class. Or, or they, they give you some additional bullshit theory that they've come across in, in the course of their education in order, to avoid, in order to avoid even touching on the topic that you're wanting to introduce in the class. They don't want to hear it, they can't be questioned because... <laughs> If they're questioned, if they're successfully questioned and they fail to answer, it makes the class pointless in their mind, at least. Not to you. If, if you pose the question that could, necessarily, uh, th that could necessarily cause them to falter in, in their class, then you pretty much prove like their thesis or their, their dissertation is, is disproven. You pretty much disprove their thesis and dissertation, but they can't have that. So they go around your question. They don't even beat around the bush. They just use additional technical jargon. They PhD and masters their way out of it. They will doctor their way out of it. So that way, to the rest of the class, they look, they appear as if they schooled you. But if you look at them face to face and in the eyes when they're telling you this, you'll see them falter you'll see them fuck up. You'll see where their line of thinking takes them to the very edge, to the very brink of their existence, of where they exist in the academic institution, in the institution of education. You'll see them, you'll see where their mind takes them to the very brink of, of not mattering, of their thesis not mattering, of their thesis being disproven. You'll see them there. And they will jump on the run. They'll jump on the run. And to the rest of the class, I mean, to those, to those young, innocent, more innocent, more naive students, um, they'll think that the professor is, is, is grandiose. Grandiose has made this grandiose gesture of imparting additional knowledge onto you, but they really haven't done shit. All they did was try to confuse and muddy the waters with additional technical jargon and so the rest of the class they'll just be nodding oh yeah and taking a note oh this but i'm over here and i sat in the back of class mind you i'm over here in the back of class asking questions that i know won't be on the exam i need to know i need to know whether their theory the theory that they hold dear even adds up because it's not practical like i said i don't need fucking theory i need practical I need something practical, something, something, something practical. That's it. I, I, I don't need the theoretical shit. I need something practical that I can put to use, that I can hustle, that I can work with, that I can profit from, that I can capitalize on, that I can push, that I can sell, that I can hustle. And theory just ain't it. But when theory is all you have, you have professors hustling theory. You have professors pushing, pushing it selling it on you and using using large words to do it with 
And yes, I know what all the large words mean. They were all used out of context. They were all used without, <laughs> without backing, without, without supporting premises. They were just all conclusive. They were just all conclusive. They were just all assertions of the professor's personal, probably biased opinion. And they never fucking helped me. So that's what I mean by my first semester and my first year, I was maybe like innocent and naive. I was naive and innocent on what academia would do for me because I really believe that I could just pursue what I wanted to learn. I could research at a, at a division one research university. I really believe that I could research what I wanted. I wanted, I, wa I wanted to start my own thesis, my own dissertation in my undergrad as a bachelor's as a as a bachelor of arts i'm not even done with this fucking ex excerpt god damn goodness gracious i'm not even done with this fucking episode i gotta stop saying god damn because the more I, I that's another episode okay as kelly draws on his whiteboard at ido he adds in universities we build these deep disciplines of knowledge within each department we're really doing hold on <clears throat> Within each department, we're doing really well. But the innovation we're missing lies in between those disciplines. We need a new approach to facilitate collaboration between the departments. We need a new approach to facilitate collaboration between the departments. You see, these motherfuckers have been in this institution so long. They've literally been institutionalized. They know nothing more than the university, than, than the traditional structure that is education and, and, and academia. They, they can't think outside of the fucking box. They only think, they, they think that they can just add more boxes to it. Ugh, fucking, we need a new approach to facilitate collaboration between the departments. Collaboration, are you fucking serious? Um, like I said, if we, if we became more flexible to the students' interests, we could have them go around general education at their will. And there are students who, who, who do see the value of, of taking both art and science, who do see the value of taking art history and, and biochemical, like or, or, or organic biochemistry, who do see the value in it. But we wouldn't fucking understand because all we know is just one one deep discipline of psychology. So a psychologist would say, well, why is this art student taking chemistry? Or why is this chemistry student taking art? That's none of your fucking business, bro. That, that's none of your fucking business, fam. Because it could be a bro or a sis. It could be some dude or a bitch. That's none of your fucking business. If the student wants to niche study, let them niche study. If they need an English class to better explain how they cured cancer, let them cure fucking cancer first because it's what they're interested in. And then they will be able to enhance their own person. They will be able to, to better present themselves if they take uh, a, a public speaking class, an English class. Let them decide that. Putting them through general education, putting folks through general education is just putting people through, through a, a meat grinder, through a mill, making general meat patties <laughs> to grill. <clears throat> we need a new approach to facilitate collaboration between the departments, Kelly says. That's where design thinking comes in. We have world-class individuals, but the new world-class requires that these world-class guys talk to each other. So essentially, Kelly, this person here, is advocating to have two world-class doctorates, PhDs, fucking experts in their fields come in and circle jerk each other, fucking give each other reach arounds in front of the class. So the class witnesses this and thinks something great is going on. Okay. All right. Fucking. Okay. Kelly is using a triad of professors to turbocharge learning. With the blessing of Stanford University President John Hennessy, he is running a class with two other professors, a business professor and a social scientist. Wow. 
In his signature Midwestern charm, Kelly describes what actually happens. We're in the classroom. The business guys, a fantastic teacher, says he's working on a project in India to get rid of kerosene and use solar. He says, if you don't write it down, it doesn't exist. I can't let him say that. So I bring up the importance of intuition and insight, which causes a heated debate to break out. All the while, the social scientist says, what do you mean by exists? The learning is incredible. There is no right answer. These guys are really passionate. And then we have a more esoteric discussion. The students are watching the whole thing. Their nervousness is all about who is going to be doing the grading at the... <laughs> You see, they even admit here that the students are nervous about the grading because there's still some form of standardized testing there. They're still testing some sharks. I bet you I bet you a fucking dollar. A dollar says that there are some sharks in this class and they're afraid. And, and you got sharks fearful about being tested, about climbing trees. It's fucking, oh my goodness. Okay. Their nervousness is all about who is going to be doing the grading. At the end of every class, we debrief with students all around us. This never happens when there is only one professor in the classroom, but there, these three guys debrief. Every once in a while, one of us will say, what do you think, to one of the students. They have to decide for themselves what is the right thing to do. Wow, how fucking novel, how fucking innovative. I mean... Granted, they're taking a step in the right direction, but it's that's never enough. It's not enough. And and for those who who view my passion as anger, it's just passion, bro. There's there's it's just passion, fam, fam. I gotta remember fam. Because uh, that's what I'm gonna be talking in corporate. I'm a, I'm a corporate. I'm a corporate fucking cowboy. I'm gonna be using fam, uh, and 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 folks. I'm gonna be using folks a lot. It's just it's just passion, folks. At no point am I actually angry. You don't hear like you don't hear me strapping up. You, you don't hear me loading guns. You don't hear me sharpening knives. I'm not angry at all. I've already done that <laughs> before the podcast. <laughs> I'm not angry at all. It's just passion. It's enthusiasm. It's catharsis. It's how I vent on this episode of the Corporate Cowboys podcast. This has been really fulfilling for me. This has been satisfying. I get my rocks off doing this shit. But only once in a while. That I mean, I can't be yelling and screaming. Yelling and screaming. And folks say that too. I can't be... <clears throat> folks say that, but I'm not actually yelling and screaming. Yelling and screaming implies zero control, but I'm in control. I'm in control, I'm just passionate, and I can't be passionate all the time, everywhere. That's not, it's not possible. So I can when I'm isolated, when I'm able to do so. And I'm not even done. This is going to be an extended episode. Fuck it. I'm already an hour in and things are just getting good. <clears throat> they have to decide for themselves what is the right thing to do. Not only do the students in the course observe triads, but they are organized into groups of about five, four class projects. A group of five is 10 potential triads if everyone is webbed with everyone else. Essentially, this is, they're, they're kind of rolling uh, in the triad, the, the concept of creating and forming triads. Similar to how incorporating associates literally means incorporating associates. The more associates you incorporate, the better off you'll be. And associates, just by the by the just in its use, you are who you closely associate with. So you're gonna to want to associate with good, better people. You're not gonna associate with bums, right? And these students apparently are in this course to learn. So they've placed them in groups of five in order to create triads and learn together and uh, bet to better learn together. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's like it's, it's associates incorporating associates, but uh, corporate cowboys do this outside of school. And corporate cowboys do this everywhere, not just in school. Um, a group of five is 10 potential triads if everyone is webbed to everyone else. It is a blast. 
you get a business student, an engineer, a social scientist, and each one gets to play the role of expert along with a couple of others. They, we put them along with a couple of others. We put them through training so they can spot dysfunctional team behavior and deal with it. Kelly's experiment is a large network of triads. This learning, Kelly says, is incredible. It's also his attempt to change the culture of Stanford and become a model other universities follow. These are really smart people, pointing back to his diagram of focused disciplines. Yeah, and, and I think I said before that, that I've said before, I feel, maybe not on this podcast, that the disciplines themselves are like siloed. They're siloed because they're deep in their thought, but there isn't a whole lot of cross communication. What you need is a corporate cowboy motherfucker, is a student, a student with the criminal mindset to not just want to be stuck in one and want to reach out to another, want to want to dip into another field and learn a little bit about what's going on there and how it will help them in their path for improvement and their path for innovation. And it's, I mean, it's not a hard concept to get, but... Obviously, it's going to be a recurring theme here. So by the end of my life, I'm pretty sure you'll understand. <laughs> I'm not going to say by the end of like our time together, because our time together could be now, could be forever later. These are really smart people, pointing back to his diagram of focused disciplines. They're constantly benchmarking success. Stanford wants people to be trained in the deep thinking of their individual disciplines as well as collaborating with other disciplines who will want to join. It's about changing the entire system, he says. We would add one triad at a time. Okay, that's nice. That's cool. Um, that was essentially the excerpt that I wanted to, to cover on that. And it lends a whole bunch of credibility to niche thinking because essentially what the professor in, in, in introducing that class structure where they have additional professors um, come in and talk to one another and discuss um, and, and discuss a topic and be able to contribute to the to the topic of discussion. And to have the students witness this and uh, evaluate what they're, what they're witnessing, pretty much, evaluate what they're listening to, uh, it, it's kind of like a school-imposed niche learning where the school is still necessarily deciding, and this is through the professor, the professor is still necessarily deciding what it is they want you to learn. And the student has to be graded for it. So, I mean, again, the, the, and I'm going to use an extreme example, the professors, the, 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 the fucking dope ass professors that they had, that they invite the business professor, the fucking psychology professor, the social sciences professor, they could all come in and circle jerk one another on some bullshit theory, literally circle jerk literally circle jerk one another on some bullshit theory because that's what peer review is. I think I've said that before too. Peer review is just the circle jerk of theory. They could circle jerk one another on, on some kind of theory. And you might think that they're, oh, they're, they're battling it out with their theories. No, it's a giant fucking circle jerk. And they do it because they get paid. They're professors. They're, they're either tenured or they're adjunct meaning that they get hired, that they're contracted to bring in and put on this play fight for you. But you're still being graded on it. So if they tell you that water is dry and the sky is green and they go back and forth on, on arguing whether or not the sky is green or if the sky is purple, they're just circle jerking one another and citing, citing bullshit theory about why it's possible. That's what they're going to grade you on. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they're going to grade these, these poor fucking students on. And I'm not a huge fan of it. <clears throat> so when I re-entered school, it was about 2015. It was like 2014, 2014. And when I got in, um, I experienced, you could say a culture shock of sorts because it was not what I expected. It was nothing like what I expected. I expected to be able to take the classes that I wanted. I mean, I knew requirements existed, but the GE requirements really, really cramped my fucking style, man. 
really cramped my style, both in community college and then later on when I transferred to uh, the, the university. Really fucking cramped my style because I wanted to study what I wanted to study. I didn't want to take art history, at least not yet. I saw no use for it. I didn't want to take art history. PE was fun, but it didn't help me. I could get my exercise outside and I still took it because I needed to. It's a general, it's a, it's a, it's a physical education requirement. And what I wanted to do was, was to get cracking on an, on a dissertation, on a thesis with the quickness, with the fucking quickness. And I was, uh, I was only led to disappointment because I couldn't, I, I couldn't, uh, get the support. I couldn't find the support for it. Um, and, and whenever I did, I was either doctored, I was PhD out of the office and, uh, you know, told the to wait or, or suggested to go the PhD route to, to, to jump into a master's program or a PhD program and, uh, figure out my dissertation then my thesis then. I mean, it's, it's fucking sad. It's sad, but at the same time, I'm not, I'm not sad about it because I, I I won't lie. I went home and I started it also, but then I realized along the way, if you've ever read a scholarly article, there is a lot of, um, formal formalized standardized work that goes into it that in no way helps the reader. No way, in no way does it help the reader. It just really helps to uh, formalize and standardize the circle jerking. That's it. It just serves to formalize and standardize the, the circle jerking. If your idea doesn't uh, isn't compatible what's with out there already, if it's not compatible with what's out there already, pretty much. And I'm using compatible in a professional sense. Like it's got to be, it's got to be uh, logically, it's got to be logically, logically aligned. So it's got to be logically aligned with what's out there. Meaning you can disprove it. It's able to be disproven. It's able to be disproved. But how it's used academically, if you go ahead and disprove a theory out there already, it won't be peer reviewed. It won't be accepted that's difficult. It's difficult to get accepted because of the circle jerking effect. It's just folks who are already benefiting off of the circle jerk. And if you say, yo, dude, circle jerk, that looks kind of gay. Like, I mean, if you disprove their theory on circle jerking then you say, yeah, but you're not, I mean, that's not like if if they say a circle jerking is hetero and, (laughs) and you're like, um, you know, it's, I can prove that circle jerking is gay because it doesn't advance anything and it's not hetero. Um, they, they, will, they will doctor you out of the office. They will doctor you out of whatever, whatever platform you think you have. They will PhD you out. They will say that, uh, that you're, I don't know, that, that you hate science or some shit. And if you don't advance what they have going on, they have no need for you. That's why if, if you're a student and you have bright ideas, keep them on you. Keep those bitches on you. Sharpen them in your off time. Sharpen your ideas in your off time. Don't pull them out in school. It's like having a knife, having a gun. I've carried one since grade school. Don't pull that shit out in school. I've carried one since third grade, I think. Yeah, since third grade. All through high school, all through university, never once pulled it out, never needed to. I mean, I've been in situations where it would have been nice to brandish it, right? But then you have witnesses, then you have snitches, fuck all that. Wow, I've gone a hundred, a hundred fucking, an hour, an hour and change, an hour and 20 minutes. This is, this has been... I think one of the most uh, one of the more ramped up episodes that I've done, and I really appreciate if you've stuck around this long. Um, go ahead and put us on your favorites list. Subscribe, like it, whatever you have to do to uh, to to have the algorithms put us in front of people's faces. I could appreciate that. If you want to support us directly, um, you will have to shoot it to me paypal.me slash corporate cowboys i'm uh i'm currently uh manager on duty so as your intern i administer 
most accounts for associates and corporating associates on, on the corporate cowboy side. So any funds that come this way will, you know, be kicked up for legal fees and, um, and indemnification for, um, what's it called? For, uh, payouts. How do you say, um, expense? That's right. So they, they could be expense. I mean, personal expenses come out and uh, indemnification for uh, outsourcing contractors and legal fees. All that gets put to good use. PayPal.me slash corporate cowboys on Cash App. That's dollar sign corporate cowboys. Venmo, that's at Alex underscore Coco. That's C-O-C-O. Venmo, that's uh, on Venmo, that's Alex underscore Coco. On PayPal, that's paypal.me slash corporate cowboys. On Cash App, that's dollar sign corporate cowboys. On Patreon, you can find us on Patreon. Subscribe. Um, we would love to have you in the future. We'll be making the bonus content as soon as we have enough enough uh, donations and, uh, and some, you know, some feasible requests, some reasonable requests. Absolutely. I'll make, um, I'll help produce, I'll, I'll help produce those. Um, on Patreon, you can find us Corporate Cowboys Podcast. There are, I believe, one or two tiers. Sign up for the highest. <laughs> on, um, and, and then anywhere podcasts are aired on YouTube, I believe we're, uh, we're a little backed up um, on, on YouTube. YouTube is updated less than other platforms, but I think if the numbers should turn in our favor on YouTube in terms of views and whatnot, that might be reprioritized. Um, and then on Instagram, Instagram is probably what we are the most active on, and I do manage that. Uh, that's at incorporating underscore associates is that the one that's incorporating dot associates underscore i a incorporating dot associates underscore i a or you can just look us up using corporate cowboys um one last piece i i wanted to uh i wanted to present Actually, my own, uh, the start to my dissertation, the start to my thesis, and you could feel free to end the podcast now. But uh, again, because the podcast is really a self-help for myself, <laughs> you're just along for the ride. And I don't mind it one bit because I'm sharpening these lock picks and you're just listening in. Are you though? Essentially, I wanted to, uh, read out loud my own the start to my the start to my own dissertation and it was just the start i recall one day i stayed up stayed up late and uh this was the last time i edited i edited the file i started the file it was like four in the morning and um i was just i was just going through it man like i was still i was still uh processing what i had to do inside of school i couldn't be as hands-on as I was used to, I couldn't be as active. You know, violence had taken on a new meaning in the academic, in academia, and uh, in scholarship. Uh, violence has had been watered down and diluted, so I couldn't, I couldn't move how I used to. I, I, <clears throat> I could not move how I used to. And it was, uh, and it took a, a brief adjustment period, and in that time to pass the time, not to pass the time, but to reconcile with myself that I wasn't, that I wasn't abandoning my calling. I, um, I sat down and I struck out, I struck out, I typed out a couple of words and um, I, just, I just need a, to read them because I've read them here personally, but uh, but to be able to read them out loud, I think, will provide me with 
additional closure and the inspiration to know that what I'm doing, the mission I'm on now, and what I've, um, what I used to think as a younger person was valid, had, um, has sound support, has logical support, sound support and logical support. And it is, um, even back then I was on the hype of logic and tact. I, I mean, I wanted to, I still want to do it all. Obviously, I recognize that I've got, I had to reprioritize my time and, um, and, um, I'm opening this up now. Obviously, I recognize that I had to reprioritize my, reprioritize my time and devote myself to the long term goal of becoming a certified professional, a licensed professional. So I had to put I had to put those masters and PhD degrees, masters and PhD dreams aside, because I did tell myself I I did try to convince myself after a while like you know if if um, if I went if I went PhD then I probably could study what I want to study at I probably could do what I want to do I you know like it's it's all still possible Alex I mean it's still within your grasp. You know, you just have to eat shit. Literally, you just have to. <laughs> okay, metaphorically, you have to eat shit uh, as an undergrad, and then you can apply for a program, and you can study what you want to study. You can study. <laughs> literally, I I wanted to study niche studying I, as a social researcher. I wanted to conduct massive, uh, massive surveying and massive research. Not massive, but you know, large, large scale research at the um, at the middle school and the high school level, because I had already done so personally at the community college and the university level. You know, just personally, just a couple hundred people. That's you don't need much, a couple hundred people to find uh, what they wanted to study and why they were studying uh, the courses they were in now. And um, yeah, I found that many of them would much rather have gone around to general ed and taken another class, taken another another course that would have that they thought would help them instead of having to fulfill fucking general education. Something that they saw no use in um at the time. Though I again, I don't put it past another person who who might be a, a total egghead, a total geek who's out there curing cancer who later discovers or later feels like you know, maybe I should take a, an English course because it would allow me to speak a little more fluidly, a little more flowery, a little and 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 these hardcore science concepts I could then parse. I I could then not parse. I could I could then um, distribute or I I could then present in a more digestible manner. Right to to lay folk to 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 the lay person to someone who might not have the strict scientific and mathematical background that they have. So that dream is still there, obviously, and um, in the future here, I'll be helping. Um, that's at least my goal is to help young students at the high school level get up out of their rut because um, a lot of a lot of students are, are in a rut because they're held back. They're literally held back when they have the entire future in the palm of their hand, literally on an iPhone, on, 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 a, on a smartphone. They have the whole, they have the entire world in the, in the palm of their hand, but they're told that they have to pass um, social studies <laughs> with at least a C. The fuck out of here. So this one here was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I, I titled it as my sociology thesis and dissertation. And I, it's dated November 22nd, 2015. And uh, <clears throat> the topic is literally on dissertations, on dissertations. So th this was back then, I was, I was thinking even more academically of just how, how uh, students 
who was niche studying could start their dissertation in fucking high school. In high school. They could start a dissertation in high school and do college level research and investigation into their personal in, into into their niche topic, into their niche topic that by the time they wanted to transfer or were ready for college, they already had credits under their belt and didn't have to go through general education. They'd already proven themselves to be of the caliber for higher education. But I mean, now looking back with the way things are going and reflecting on the way things have been going in education with COVID and social distancing and, and online learning, distance learning. It's a fucking pipe dream. It's a pipe dream. It's it's gonna it requires getting your hands dirty physically again. Anyways. <clears throat> and I even put by Alex, the associate. Holy shit. As a student of life, I don't appreciate wasting time. I'm able to recognize that I'm not as productive as I would like. In order to advance, one must move in the direction necessary to beget progress. As a college student, it is safe to say my thoughts aren't the only to have highlighted on the procession pupils must embark to arrive at certification as one of redundancy, inefficiency, and at times treachery. This little, this little cat was on fire, y'all. This dissertation of sorts will serve to make light of the social structure that is academia after the computer has been invented. Yeah, I was highlighting on how the computer should have changed academia, but the fact that they didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to take their hands away from the circle jerk means that the computer came, that means that the computer came and went and the best they got going for them right now is fucking canvas fucking whiteboard fucking blackboard fucking uh, yeah just 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 online just online platforms that's that's the best they got fucking going for them this sociological thesis is written by a college student so the language may not be the most formal as i would like to think that peers of any age would concur that distinction comes from understanding out of respect for respect not simply comprehending for the sake of apprehension essentially what i'm trying to say there is that understanding comes out of respect it comes out of appreciation. It doesn't come out of apprehension, out of apprehension for a test. You feel me? I'm not saying what I'm saying so because I'm going to give a test afterwards is, is, is what I'm getting at. So you, you either understand because you respect and appreciate what's, what's coming across, not because you have to fucking memorize it because you're, you'll be tested on it. I give a shit about tests. I give a shit about standardized testing. S standardized test doesn't make you a, a, a smart fish or a dumb monkey. The intent of bringing attention to this matter in education is to propel the potential toward the actively kinetic, to streamline the current certifications process and hopefully acquire my own in the process. <laughs> <laughs> Young Alex, so fucking naive, holy shit. Essentially, what I'm trying to I'm trying to mix in some of that some of that scientific language, you know, to to propel the potential toward the actively kinetic. That's just tying in like the concepts of potential energy and kinetic energy. The potential energy being stored energy, unused energy, and and propelling it towards the actively kinetic to put it to use to 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 bring out its utility. And, and then to streamline the current certifications process, meaning like the actual like acquisition, like the actual, what is it? Obtaining, obtainment of degrees. The actual degree obtainment process. The degree certi certification process. I wanted to, to streamline that process and then hopefully acquire mine in the process. Like with this dissertation, I hoped to get a bachelor's out of it. And I did this shit when I was in community college community college going after just an associate's degree. I wanted a whole fucking bachelor's out of it because I knew what I was going to embark on or what I wanted to embark on necessarily called for higher level thinking, higher level investigation, higher level exploration. But motherfucking professors 
whose job they feel is to gatekeep are going to gatekeep your ass whether or not you want to, whether or not you want it to happen. They're going to doctor you. They're going to PhD you out of their office. They don't want to hear about something better. They want to, they, they want the circle jerk. And if you aren't there for the circle jerk, you're at the wrong party. You're in the wrong fucking office. All they know is, is, is self gratification, not, not even self gratification, it's circular gratification. That's all they know when it comes to peer review. The data and opinions campaign, <clears throat> the data and opinions contained within this paper have all been acquired firsthand in interviews and with the most bias, most bias of persuasion? Yeah, okay. <laughs> With the most bias of persuasion, though without incentivizing, doctoring, manipulating, or omitting the results thereof. I, I don't know if I meant bias or unbiased, but that that fucking that sense is sound regardless. That's how bad, and not bad. That's how fucking what is it? <laughs> that's how fucking criminal your intern was, way back when. Criminal mind. I'm telling you, bias or unbiased. What I'm saying there is that I could operate under any condition. And I mean, I still can. Obviously, I, I would much rather operate in ideal conditions. But what I'm saying there with the most bias of persuasion is I could operate under any fucking condition. You could throw me, you could throw me in the fire and, and I'll, make it, I'll make it feel cool. I'll make it look cool. Hot fire. Cool. It should be obvious, written here, that maximum agreement was the ultimate goal. Though interviewees were not privy whatsoever to the bias, only prompted to answer yes or no after learning of the theoretical proposed initiative for academic reform. Essentially, I, I asked my interviewees uh, yes or no questions, and <clears throat> the que I'm not going to go through them right now. Again, this is just my dissertation. Uh, my research I'm going to hold as proprietary for the time being um, because uh, the more we dehumanize humans, the more valuable this research becomes. And yeah, I am speculating a little bit, but the, the research, anybody can fucking do it. Anybody can fucking do this research. But just the fact that it's already been done and completed, the more we dehumanize humans and the more we humanize corporations – this research is going <clears> to <throat> is going to become valuable and again it's it's laced into the theme of this podcast and the theme is recurring so come on back anytime you want the thesis this thesis in regards to academia is <clears throat> hold on this thesis in regards to academia it's unaudited infrastructure and the professionals who aspire to advance in their prospective fields of study without recognition is directed to the deans presiding over their prospective fields of study. I won't attempt to get intimate with every subject to avoid having a precise article become a profound string of consciousness without theme or setting. So the setting will be the present and the theme will be the student's graduate, reoccurring, if done correctly. That's a lot to unpack right there, but I'll continue. I'm, I can come back to this later. I mean, this is, this is, um, this is the theme of life right here. Like this, young, young Alex, bro. Young Alex was just going through some things. He he had learned. He had learned the easy way and he learned the hard way. And I could, I could reading it now, I, I see it. I could spring back some, um, some, some passion. I don't want to say emotion, but I'm sure it's there too. For, for him to stay up at 4 a.m. trying to knock something out, it's because he cared. I mean, I still care. As an aspiring professional and sociologist, it is my belief that sociology is the best field to major in. <laughs> Look at this kid. Just as I believe a chemist should argue that chemistry is the best subject for study and a physical therapist kinesiology. <laughs> I mean, it's all logical. Using assumptive scholarship, assumptive scholarship, I won't resort to relating how a change in academia might affect every field, just my own. The opinions that expressed 
The opinions expressed in this article have been derived exclusively from college students and without discrimination of any kind. In further research, any further research has been found to be made impossible without attempting academic reform and continuously monitoring the results of said initiatives. That being said, the scientific method is a viable research process which that being said, the scientific method with a viable research process would be most suitable for the case about to be made. Ponder and enjoy. Yo, it's like, I'm like, uh, it's like, it's like I'm advising them and at the same time, I'm warning them. <laughs> Dude, sometimes, sometimes I feel like young Alex would thrive right now, but obviously it's a growing process. Young Alex had to go through what they went through in order for them to be me now. Like me now, I'm just, I'm just a fucking, I'm a pat, like, I'm not a passive aggressive person. I'm a passive passive. I think I've said that before. I'm so passive. Death is nothing. Death is passing. You could squeeze a trigger and not blink your eyes. It's just, just passing. So determining the research question, has academia falling behind by simply refusing to adapt in the face of modern technology? Like, how simple is that fucking question? And it's like, the answer should be obvious, and it's obvious to the students who have ears to listen and eyes to see. It's obvious, the shit is obvious. Has academia fallen behind on times by simply refusing to adapt in the face of modern technology? This question stems from a question asked most often to counselors what classes to take and whether or not they will help toward certification. It seems most college students are familiar with what they would like to study and create a future career in. College students are most familiar. That's what that sentence should say. It seems most college students are familiar with what they would like to study and create a future career in. Hold on, no, actually that, that sentence reads right also. It seems because the, uh, the, the data says it, pretty much says it, like most college students that I was able to interview, they were, most college students were already familiar with what they wanted to study. They were already, they were already familiar to an extent with what they wanted to study because they had a previous interest in it. Why the fuck would you major in something you have no interest in, right? They were most familiar with it. They, they were familiar with it already before they wanted to study it. And they had an idea of what their career would look like. Obviously, they had, they had ideas of where to start. I mean, they had assumptions of where to start also. Like, oh, maybe I'll get a job. I'll become an intern in this place and get the experience. But they, they already had an idea. They, had, they were familiar with, the, they're familiar with the area they want to study in and you know, can conceive of, of a future career in it. Developing a thesis researched, peer edited, and reviewed to forego general education would be a much more efficient method of creating professionals. Though this seems to be popular opinion, one had to, one, hold on. Though this seems to be popular opinion, one had to ask themselves um, why general education should be foregone. Though this seems to be popular opinion, one had to ask themselves why general education should be foregone. I don't know if uh, that sense is saying, though this seems to be pop because I, I keep uh, keep pausing and, and, and commenting on it, which I should probably do a little less of, but I don't give a fuck. If you can follow, I mean, it's a lunch hour. It's a fucking, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extended lunch hour. What, is your, your boss gonna fire you or something? Put some fucking headphones in. Developing a thesis, researched, peer edited, and reviewed to forego general education would be a much more efficient method of creating professionals. Though this seems to be popular opinion, one had to ask themselves why general education should be foregone. This prompts students to take a closer look at and review information available about their prospective fields. So essentially what I was, what I was uh, suggesting is expanding the field of, of peer review. That's why I said peer edited and reviewed because this would allow students to work together and it would allow students to work with professors, with professors. 
not for professors. Fuck research assistants. Because a, a being, being a research assistant only exposes you to what the professor is looking for. And as a research assistant, I've... I've heard professors tell their assistants to ignore certain results, certain outcomes, to ignore certain discoveries because it doesn't align with their <clears throat> cognitive dissonance because it doesn't allow with their it doesn't align with their dissertation. It doesn't align with their thesis. They want that PhD so bad that they're willing to bury that they're willing to bury you <laughs> because you found the facts. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, you might say like academia is fucking soft as shit. They won't get their hands dirty. They have ways of papering you up, doctoring you, PhDing you. They have ways to not make you graduate. And if you're already in debt and, and, and they say, you know what? Like, no, like you can't expose this. Like if, if you want to be part of the circle jerk, you'll have to be, you have to suck my dick first. <laughs> Some students will do it. Males, females. Guys, bitches, fucking, they'll do it. They'll do it. That was another reason why I, I chose maybe maybe not to pursue um, a graduate degree, a uh, fucking PhD in soft science because soft motherfuckers can be treacherous. So reviewing the literature, that was the next section. I won't bore my intended audience with opinions published online and in magazines because they're all the fucking opinions. Plenty of which exist. Again, using assumptive scholarship, I called it assumptive scholarship. I think I was, uh, I was having trouble then coining niche research, uh, niche studying. But uh, I think later on I would have coined it. Um, and I know I, I coined it like in that year because um, only reason I didn't, I didn't uh, introduce niche research is because... Um, I still had a complex. I, I had a, I had a student complex. I felt like, I felt like my opinion wasn't valid enough. Like I didn't have enough, um, enough fucking what is it? Enough rapport under my belt. Enough fucking scholar scholarly work under my belt. Where, where if I introduced, uh, this this term niche studying, it wouldn't be respected or it would be called into question. Keep in mind, like this is all premised on the idea, on the pipe dream that, uh, you know, that assumptive research would be accepted, would be made an exception for students who wanted to pursue it in order to get a bachelor's degree in as early as two years or three years right out of high school. And um, yeah, I mean, um, it just goes to show like young Alex, he was still, he still wanted to respect the rules uh, me now, I, me, Alex, current present day Alex gives a fuck about the rules. I mean, I, I acknowledge that the rules exist, but that's like, as far as I'll go. Um, I just acknowledge that they exist, but, but I've seen enough. I've seen enough in my lifetime where acknowledge, acknowledgement only goes so far that, uh, that discrepancy between rule and practice policy and practice is 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 ever present so in reviewing the literature i won't bore my intended audience with opinions published online and in magazines plenty of which exist again using assumptive scholarship i am to assume you are more knowledgeable on the subject of education I, I, again on using assumptive scholarship oh i get it now i get it now so it wasn't so much that i was I was uh, having trouble coining uh, niche studying, but I was trying to coin, and that's why I, that's why this is different. I was trying to coin at the time assumptive scholarship, and assumptive scholarship go, goes back to uh, the student, the student who wants to study, already being somewhat familiar with the field that they want to study and create a career in. Uh, that's assumptive studying. Uh, uh, assumptive scholarship and I wanted to coin that because uh, students would major in a subject assuming that they want to study it assuming that there was a want to, to study it and that they were already somewhat familiar with it even if only as a novice even if only uh, even if only it's, uh, if it's a beginner's familiarity 
So I won't bore my intended audience with opinions published online and in magazines, plenty of which exist. Again, using assumptive scholarship, I am to assume you are more knowledgeable on the subject of education. I am simply a student proposing an amendment to better everyone's social experience in their own pursuit to become certified, to, 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 get, uh, to graduate, essentially, to graduate to get that degree. The data attached should suffice to represent the popular opinion of undergrads in all institutions. And at the time, because uh, I was going to one of the largest, I was attended one. I was attending one of the largest community college systems in California at the time. Uh, this was 2015. I was I was attending at the time. It was ranked. Uh, if not the largest, if I'm not mistaken, if not the largest, the most diverse, the most diverse. And I, and I think it was ranked too. Like, yeah, I get social science likes to hand out participation medals or whatever. But in this case, likes to hand out participation awards. But in this case, uh, attending the most diverse community college at the time actually worked in my favor. You see, I, f I found a way to have postmodernism work for me. I found a way to have watered down social fuckery work for me i have i found a way to find diluted social fuckery work to my advantage and um and 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 that, that's the furthest i wrote that that's the furthest i wrote i think it was it wasn't even two pages it wasn't even two pages and um and that's when i uh that's when i i quit this was november 22nd 2015 4.01 a.m. Goodness gracious, Alex. <laughs> Assumptive scholarship. Yo, I got to use that too. But that's why I, I think... I think I coined niche studying after the fact because it's more general where assumptive scholarship, just the term scholarship assumes that you're in school and that you're producing scholarly work. Um, that's why I, I, if I recall now my train of thought, I went towards niche studying because niche studying was generalized. Anybody could fucking do it in school or out of it. And assumptive scholarship kind of assumes that you're creating scholarly work, that you're going to create scholarly work, assumes that you are to be a scholar, assumptive scholarship. Oh, man. But it's the weekend. Have a great weekend. See you next time. Much love. Alex.